called The Answer.
Paul's testimony um, on his conversion, his uh, meeting the Lord on the road to Damascus. Um, he, he saw the Lord and he was truly humbled. Uh, I hope that we can all keep that, that awesome, that might, that power in mind when we praise our great God.
praise him. We give you glory. Lord, your name is the, the name at which every knee will bow one day. God, may we be the ones that uh, bow our knees before then, recognizing you as high and lifted up, glorious, and majestic, and mighty. Lord, thank you that you all are all of those things. We don't uh, assign you those names, those uh, adjectives, and then find out that you were lacking. Thank you for your amazing love, Lord God. Thank you that as we see ourselves, we, we see our frailty, our uh, sinfulness, and then we see your holiness, your might, your power, your glory. Lord God, we give you thanks. We give you honor. Lord, as we read through and hear Paul's recounting of his testimony when he met you on the road, God, we don't all have uh, this amazing moment where we recognize that we've trusted in our Savior. Some of us said it was a slow progression. That's all right. As long as we've met you, Lord God, as long as we have trusted in you, your finished work on the cross, your sacrifice that paid the price once and for all. God, I ask that our hearts be soft towards you, towards your leading, towards your prompting. May we extricate the sin that is in our lives. May we draw close to you, leaning on the power of your spirit. You are great. You are mighty. Lord God, we ask these things in the precious and beautiful name of our loving Savior, Jesus. Amen. And um, we're going to be looking at uh, today in chapter 22, Paul's testimony, uh, our example. And so have you ever been asked to give your testimony? Have you? Have you have you done that before? Uh, it can be a little scary when you hadn't done it a lot, but it, it's it's such an important thing. You know what is a testimony? Uh, you know what is a testimony? I bet I bet uh, you know that's used a lot uh, when you're in a, another place like like they've been, and so you know um, it's not talking about a testimony in a court of law. We're talking about the Christian testimony. Your Christian testimony is how you became a Christian. And how Christ has changed your life. What you were before your relationship with Christ. How he changed your life. And, and then what, how you are different after. And uh, some, of, you know, some who are still in, in sinful lifestyles uh, might say that they're still building their testimony. And um, you know, let's go party and build a testimony. That's not what we want. <laughs> Did you realize to become a member of Grace Bible Church, this local body of believers that you are asked to do a couple of things. You're asked to agree with our doctrinal statement, and then we provide that to anyone who wants to be a member. And the other thing is that we ask you to share your testimony with uh, some of our uh, elders from our board, uh, our church board, or with them. So to share, because really the only requirement to be a part of the body of Christ is that you're a believer. And the, and the other part is to agree with, with our uh and be in agreement with us in, in our doctrine. And so that's how you become a part of the body of Christ here, this local group. And, uh, and so you're not a part of the body of Christ if you do not know Christ personally. And so uh, you cannot become a member if you don't have a testimony. You know, I was looking at some of the resources for preparing today, and, and actually I was looking on Crew's uh, website. And, uh, and I would imagine that they have a lot of, of things about this and how effective this is in, in that ministry. And so I wanted to read just a little bit from it. It says this, your story is his story. It says, every time you tell your story of how you became a follower of Jesus, your testimony, you give honor and glory to God. And he is pleased with that. And this, again, this is from their website. Your story, regardless of how spectacular or ordinary you think it is, as Ty mentioned earlier, is a story about God's character. It is your eyewitness account of how God rescued you from sin and death through Christ and changed your life as a result. When you share your story with others, you help them get to know what God is like and what he can do. I thought that was well written and, you know, as we, as we look at this today, we're going to be looking at, at uh, four key components in, uh, in sharing your testimony. And so if you have struggled with this, if you're like, well, what, what do I do? What do I include? Today, I believe you will get some of those answers uh, based on what Paul shares with us about his testimony. And but before we get started in that, I just, you know, I was thinking about 
uh, some, some facts that I came across on, you know, some of the polling that takes place. This is an, another current one. And uh, this is from the Gallup uh, people that do a lot of polls. And this is entitled Americans' Belief in Five Spiritual Entities from 2001 to 2023, the differences in their beliefs. And so uh, for each of the following, let me read it to you. It says, for each of the following items I'm going to read you, please tell whether it is something you believe in, something you're not sure about, or something you don't believe in. And so what we're looking, going to be looking at is the percentage of uh, those who, who said they believe in these things. There are five things. The first one is God. And in 2001, uh, 90% of Americans believed in God. Now in 2023, that's down to 74%. In 2001, they were asked who believes in a literal heaven. 83% said they believe in heaven. And today it's down to 67% of Americans say they believe in a literal heaven. Same thing with angels. Angels was 79% down to 69%. Hell, a literal hell was, uh, uh, you can easily see it, it's the red line on there. But uh, 71% in 2001 down to 59% in 2023. And then the last one, the devil, a literal Satan, uh, 68% down to 58%. So you wonder, you know, the decline of America's faith in God, is, it's well documented. It's, there are polls, there are statistics. And, you know, with the culture shifting more and more away from personal face-to-face -face interaction, I wonder, this is just something that I've been thinking about as I looked at this and I was thinking about the passage today on personal testimony um, I was thinking, I just wonder if the number of Christians who are sharing their testimony has gone down as well. And, and so wouldn't it be something if the answer was something so simple as Christians not taking the time to share their testimony? And uh, if that makes such a difference, then maybe these statistics would be different if we would do that. Isn't that interesting that, you know, a lot of times we look at all the complications of going, things going on, and I have a feeling the answer to our culture, the answer to our world is something way more simpler than we realize. You know, do you know that uh, Romans 10, which is, Romans is, is a letter of Paul, and, and this is Paul's testimony we're going to look at today. In Romans 10, 13 through 14, he says, um, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he goes on and he says, how then can they call on him uh, they, have, they have not believed in? So, if you, so what happens first? You've got to believe to call in on his name, right? And then he goes on and says, how can they believe without hearing about him? Is it that simple? People are just not hearing about Christ. He's, they're not hearing about changed lives because Possibly, we're just not sharing our testimonies. And Paul called on the name of the Lord. We're going to read that in this passage because he heard the gospel from Christ himself. And he believed because it says he wrote himself. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how can they do that unless they have believed? So Paul is a believer. He called on the name of the Lord. He says that in his testimony. And he says, you know, um, his testimony is, is, is what we're going to be looking at and, and then using it as an example for us. Now, the, uh, the first of those four key components is your condition. They all start with C, your condition before Christ. We often used to refer to this as our BC days before Christ. And, um, you know, let me ask you this. What were you like before you met Jesus Christ as your Savior? What were you like before Jesus came into your life, B.C., before Christ? And you might be saying, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I'm still the same person I was then. Well, that's not a testimony then, is it? That's a problem because there's not been any life change. 
A testimony is all about how our lives have been changed by Christ. An airplane flew into the uh, a violent uh, thunderstorm and was soon swaying and bumping around. And, and uh, one nervous lady happened to be sitting next to a pastor. And uh, she turned to him for comfort and said, can't you do anything? And, <laughs> and uh, she kind of was forceful about it. And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am. He said gently, I'm in sales, not management. <laughs> I love that. But you know, we are, we are called to make disciples. We are called to sell, if you will, to, to spread the gospel. And it's called evangelism, witness to others. And, and one of the best ways to do that, uh, the framework of one of the very best ways to share the gospel is your testimony. And so your testimony combined with the gospel is very, very powerful. You know, I, I used to be um, before Christ, and I was a different person. I, I remember uh, I got saved at, at age 10, but even then, you know, I was always the, the, the class clown. I was always the, the jokester. And, but I used jokes uh, really to be a jerk and to cut down people. And, and that has changed in my life. And that's why I do puns today. Because puns don't hurt people if you don't use any, uh, any bad ones. And, and, and other joking can be hurtful. And so, you know, looking for ways to see how we are different because of Christ in our life. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the first part that Paul shares his B.C., if you will. And so let's start looking at uh, chapter 22, verse 1. Brothers and fathers, by the way, that's the same way that Stephen addressed the, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, and remember, there was a, there was a riot, and, and Paul was, uh, you know, he was uh, taken up, and they were... They were beating him, and then they, he was taken uh, over by the, the commander, the Roman commander, and, and so he was given an opportunity to speak to the, to the Jewish people. And so he says, brothers and fathers, the Jewish leaders, listen now to my defense before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Aramaic, they became even quieter. That was the language of their day, the, 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 the language that they would recognize, just like I recognize those who speak Texan, you know, when they come here. Uh, or wherever you're from, you, you just you, you connect with those people. And he goes on and says, he continued, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but uh, brought up in this city, um, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictness of our ancestral law. I was zealous for God, just as all of you are today. Notice how he's connecting with the, the Jewish people and the Jewish leaders. He's connecting with them. And, uh, and, and building a bridge to them. And he goes on and says, I persecuted this way. And the way here capitalized is the church. These are the believers who, who spoke of the way. And the way is Jesus Christ. Uh, the way, the truth, and the life. And so they called the, the church the way. Paul said, I persecuted this way to the death. Arresting and putting both men and women in jail. As both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. And then he goes on and, and continues in verse 5. After I received letters from them to the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to arrest those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. Now we know that this is somewhat similar to what we read in Acts 9. And there's actually three places in Acts that, that uh, Paul uh, Paul's testimony is, is shared. And so we can go to those three, I believe I mentioned in your notes. But the first thing that Paul's doing here is he's, he's building a, a cultural bridge. You know, and it says in 1 Corinthians 9, another letter by Paul. Uh, you know, as he's building this cultural bridge, he says, Although I am free from, from all and, and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not 
without God's law, but under the law of Christ to win those without the law. And to, to the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things. This is the key. I've become all things to all people so that I may be, uh, uh, may by every possible means save some. And so Paul used his being a, a Jew to speak to the Jewish people, to, to reach out to them, to build that cultural bridge. And so that was, that's something that you want to uh, be uh, thinking about as you're, as you're writing down your testimony. And by the way, that's going to be your homework for this week, <laughs> is to write it out. Don't just say, well, I think I got it. No, write it out. And then you'll be able to, you don't have to read it to people, but write it out so that you will know how you will share and, and you can say, oh yeah, this is, I forgot about this or, you know, and then, and even go so far for some of you, this is important, is to find somebody that you can be accountable with and practice walking through that. But, um, but you see that Paul built this, this cultural bridge. But the thing is, a lot of times what happens is that we build this, we, we make this common ground of, of small talk and, and current events and weather and common interests, and then it stops there. And that's where, that's just a bridge to get it started. Next is Paul built a spiritual bridge. Did you know that he said he was zealous for God? He turned the conversation to God. And, and that's what we need to do. Um, and how do we do that? You know, I think a lot of people, that's where it maybe is the struggle, is how do we turn the conversation to, to that which is spiritual? And, you know, I will, I'll give you the gentle way, a little more forceful way, and a bold way. All right? Just, just examples. There are many, many ways. I would say the best way to do it is to be yourself and find what works for you but make sure you have some of the key components. But the first one I would say that is a gentle way to build a spiritual bridge as you're talking to someone is just simply ask, hey, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? That turns the conversation to, to, to prayer. It takes a spiritual turn, and uh, it also begins to, you're asking them to share about themselves. And so it's a very gentle way of turning that corner from cultural a bridge to a spiritual bridge. Now, still gentle, you could say something like this. This is just an example, something that I might say. So, boy, you know, we're talking about the world and the, and the craziness of the world. And I say, man, the world sure is going crazy. You know, God, though, God is in control. And, um, you know, what are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about God? Again, pretty gentle. Uh, you know, and, and it's, but then there's another one, a bold way. You could say this, Hey, can I, can I share with you how Christ has changed my life? Another bold, bolder way to do it, or even bolder yet. Has anyone ever shown you in scripture how you can be saved and then have some verses already in, in preparation? You know, one of the things that's great about our Bibles is that there's always a couple of blank sheets in the back. You can always write down a few notes if you're worried about, you know, where you're going to go. And uh, I, I like the Roman road because it's, it's easy to remember. And what I did in Romans is I go to Romans 3.23 and uh, right there where I start and I write the next verse in Romans, you know, Romans 6.23, whatever it might be. And so I just wrote them next to the verse. I st all I have to do is remember one verse. I get to the first verse and then I have a chain of of uh, verses that I can go to. But you know, here's the thing. It says in Ephesians, it says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. In other words, let's make the most of our time. Let's not waste opportunities. Did you know that even, even in our foyer, when you're sharing things about the weather or you're talking about those things, did you know a lot of people that, are, that come here have not shared why they're hurting, why they're going through a difficult time? And uh, even right here in our foyer, take that step. 
turn the conversation to the spiritual bridge and say, hey, how can I pray for you? And uh, you know, you'd be surprised how much ministry, how much sharing of Christ happens right in our foyer, right in our church, between services, and uh, as it should, as it should. So that's the first step is, is uh, your condition before Christ. The next step is your conversion because of Christ. Let's look at what Paul said. As I was traveling and approaching Damascus about noon, uh, an intense light from heaven suddenly flashed around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light. Did you know that I, 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 I Googled this, not Googled it, I searched it on my Bible software, because that phrase, I saw the light. How many songs have you heard that phrase in a song, right? And this is the only time that I could find that the actual phrase, I you know, saw the light uh, in just that way is in, in Scripture. So it was referring to Paul's, Paul's testimony. He saw the light. He saw a literal light, but also he actually saw the light of the gospel. And so, but he says, I saw the light, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me, those who were with him. And I said, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told everything that you have been assigned to do. Since I couldn't see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand of by those who were with me and went into Damascus. And someone named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, notice that he, he said something that, about him based on his, his uh, Jewish uh, character for those who were, he was talking to. A devout man according to the law who had a good reputation with all the Jews living there. He came and stood by me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And in that very hour, I looked up and saw him. And he said, The God of our ancestors has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one. And notice his capital, which is talking about Christ. And to hear the words from his mouth, since you will be a witness for him to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now... Why are you delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so we talked earlier about the fact that he called upon his name uh, because he believed and he believed because he heard and he heard from Christ. And so Paul explained a couple of things. He explained his encounter with Christ. He went through there and talked about what happened. Now, and not all of us are going to have this uh, ex extraordinary uh, circumstance in where we encountered Christ. I trusted Christ at a, uh, a Baptist encampment when I was 10 years old uh, down in Texas. I went to camp because our church sent us to church camp and, or to Bible camp. And, and that's where it finally clicked. It finally made sense. And I went down as they, as they explained the gospel and, and called us to, to trust in Christ. I went down and did that. And um, since then, my life has been different, and and Christ has has continued to, to grow. I've been continuing to grow in Christ. Now, in my teen years, I, I I struggled. I struggled in my teen years, and and uh, to make my faith my own. And then I realized, after making some some mistakes, that I had gotten off track. And I I, I dedicated my life to Christ, and and also at that time, I dedicated my life to to ministry. And, um, and it was because of my struggles in, in youth, uh, that, that age group, that I became a youth pastor. And, um, and so we all have those kinds of stories. Mine isn't some bright light that God shined on me. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to camp like a lot of us do, and I got saved there. And I, you know, um, but um, the thing is, we just share what happened to us. People can't argue with experience. That was your experience. Tell people how you encountered Christ and how he has made a difference. Now, I know with the different accounts of Paul's testimony here, some people will go into Acts 9, and then they'll look at Acts 22, and then they'll look at Acts 26, and Paul has some 
different things as he, as he kind of customizes his testimony to the people that he's talking to. And some people try to find contradictions in there. Uh, if anybody goes down that line with you, just say, look, you know, guess what? Luke wrote the whole thing. If it was a contradiction, Luke would have fixed it. So some of those things, you just have to dig a little deeper to understand why it's not a contradiction. But, but you can do that. It's, it's, it's not a contradiction. And uh, the same guy wrote the whole thing and, uh, and was a friend of Paul. So if there was a contradiction, he would have figured it out. So we don't have to worry about that. The, the word of God is accurate. And uh, it is true, all of it. And then so not only did he explain his encounter, but Paul explained the identity of Christ, the righteous one. You know, he was identifying to his listeners that Christ is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And we need to tell people he is our Savior. He's the Son of God, fully God, fully man. They need to know who Christ is. And then Paul explained his salvation through Christ. And, uh, and we've gone, already gone over this, but Romans 10 you know, Paul's sins, again, somebody might take this verse and out of context, Paul's sins were not washed away by baptism, but that connects with the last part, by calling on his name. And when he called on the name of the Lord, he called on the name of the Lord because he believed. And how did he believe? Because he heard. He heard directly from Jesus. Now, we all don't get that, but, you know, when we share our testimony, people are hearing. They're hearing uh, from Jesus through you. And me. And so, and then also, again, just as a, as a clarification, baptism is an act of obedience that, that we do after salvation that symbolizes the baptism that takes place in the heart at the moment of salvation. That's a, uh, it's a symbol of that which is of uh, the reality is in, in the Holy Spirit and so in our, in our hearts. So here's the application here, and that is have you had a genuine life-changing encounter with Jesus? If you have, then you need to have a testimony that you're prepared to share with others. And that's how you're going to share the gospel in, in a very effective way. And, you know, the other question is, can you explain to someone who Jesus is and how to be saved? You know, you can use even, you know, that... Uh, you can use John three sixteen. You can use the Roman road. You could even use uh, Romans 10. You know, there are so many different ways and so many different passages, but we need to know uh, how uh, people need to know how they can be saved through scripture. Uh, number three is your calling based on Christ. So let's look at this. This is a, this is also now your life after your encounter with Christ, after you have had a conversion to Christ and, and been changed. It says, After I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him telling me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Now, Paul is still telling this testimony, and he's telling them that, that, that uh, he was told that the Jewish people will not accept your testimony. There it even says, it's his testimony. He goes on and says, but I, but I said, Lord, they know that, I'm, that in synagogue after synagogue, I had those who believed in you imprisoned and beaten. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I stood there giving approval and guarding the clothes of those who killed him. He said to me, go because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so your calling Paul was called to go to the Gentiles. Now, everywhere he went, as we've seen in Acts, he goes to the synagogue first, but he was, old, he was told. In his testimony, he revealed, he was told that they're not going to believe the testimony about, about Christ. They're not going to believe, and so Paul is sent to the Gentiles. And so Jesus revealed who Paul's ministry focus was, the Gentiles. And so when you look at Romans 15, it, it also tells us, it says, nevertheless, I have written to remind you more boldly on some points because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, serving as a priest of the gospel of God. We're all priests representing God to the people. You know, and that's what a priest does. We're representing God. And Paul was called to represent to the Gentiles, to those who are not Jewish. And that's why he's going out on these missionary journeys. And, uh, but here's the thing. 
How do we apply this? Who has God sent you to? Maybe you're the best choice to reach those at your workplace. Maybe you're God's best choice to, to reach people at your school. I guarantee you, if you're a parent, God's already chosen you to be the best way to reach your children for Christ or to reach your spouse. And so who has God called you to minister to? Maybe you have a story like mine where you're, then you feel called to, to youth ministry and and maybe the, the people that you've been called to will, will change over time. Mine went from youth ministry to adult ministry um, and so in more families. And so, you know, that changes in time with different, different seasons of our life. Also, Jesus revealed why Paul was sent to the Gentiles. And uh, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but I want to just talk to you about just briefly. First of all, he was appointed by Christ himself to go to the Gentiles. And then also... He was trained in the scriptures. There was no one better trained to explain and teach the scriptures to the Gentiles than Paul. God knew what he was doing. And he knows what he's doing when he says, you are perfect to go to your friends, to go to your coworkers. You're the one he's chosen to plant you where you are right now. And then also Paul uh, was called because of the rejection of the gospel of the Jews. We were just told that. They're not going to the Jews aren't going to accept your testimony and so about Jesus, so you're going to have to go out and spread it to the others. And you're going to find that you, you feel called to go to a certain person, maybe it's your family member or maybe it's a friend, and you're going to share Christ with them, and, and they're, going, they're not going to accept. We, we can't control that. It's a choice. Don't let that stop you. Don't let that discourage you and say, hey, I can't do this because I'm, I'm not effective. That's not our place. Our place is to be faithful. It's God. The results are God's. We can't worry about the results. And uh, we just, if, if someone rejects the message, we go and, and go to someone else. And uh, his conversion, his testimony, you know, the fact that uh, Paul changed from, from uh, being on board with the Jews um, to being not the one that uh, was, was fulfilling their mission, didn't bode well with them. But for those who finally realized that Paul's life changed and he's no longer trying to kill Christians, that meant a lot to them. So sometimes your conversion, your experience, how you were converted in, in, in your prior BC life, and all of that comes into play as to who and, and why you're sent in certain places. God has a purpose, and he has one for you. And he was both Jewish and a Roman citizen. So you can see how Paul was perfect to go out and, and speak to those in the Roman world. So the application here before we get to the very last is, is who has God given you uh, a passion to reach for Christ and why? Think about that. Think about that. The last, the last C here, number four, the conviction brought by Christ. Let's just read this last part. This will go fairly quick. They, they listened to him up to this point, and then they raised their voices, shouting, Wipe this man off the face of the earth. He should not be allowed to live. If you give your testimony and you hear that, don't give up. <laughs> Hopefully you won't hear that, but it might happen. As they were yelling and flinging uh, aside their garments and throwing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, directing that he be interrogated with the scourge uh, to discover the, the reason they were shouting against him like this. And uh, that, that was a terrible, that, people died under that kind of a whipping. And as they stretched him out for the lash, Paul said to the centurion standing by, is it legal for you to, to scourge a, a man who is a Roman citizen and is uncondemned? Yeah. <laughs> Paul used what God had given him which is Roman citizenship. And when the centurion heard this, he went and reported to the commander saying, what are you going to do for this man is a Roman citizen? And the commander came and said to him, tell me, you are a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And the commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money. But I was born a citizen, Paul said. That was even more valuable. And so those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. Um to give him the, the little attitude adjustment with the scourge ended right there. 
And the commander, too, was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen and he, and he had bound him. And that's where we're going to end today. But you know, not all conviction leads to salvation. And I'm not going to read this verse, but in 2 Corinthians, you know, there's godly grief that produces repentance. And it also talks about worldly grief that produces death. Read that verse. And you realize that just because people are sorry and, 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 and feel guilty, it doesn't always lead to salvation. And so, but God may be convicting them, may be putting it on their heart. Uh, but sometimes it takes to hear the gospel more than just one time. Many times it takes oftentimes for people to hear the gospel. And also the, the Jews stumbled over the stumbling stone, Romans 9, 30 through 33. What should we say then, Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness uh, have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Why were they rejecting the message? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were by works. That's a big stumbling block for people is that they're, they're caught in this whole work salvation. And they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. And the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Bottom line is this, as we close, be faithful. Share your testimony and leave the results to the Lord. Sometimes he's a stumbling stone to people and they need that. That might be critical for them to, on their journey to eventually believing in Christ. Write out your testimony. Understand what the gospel is and of all the things we've studied and, and, and put that in there and be amazed at how when you share that with others that you'll see their lives changed as your life was changed. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the fact that uh, you have changed our lives uh, from the inside. That you've provided such a, a, an amazing salvation that, that when we believe not but based on our works, but when we believe, truly believe in, uh, in Christ's death and resurrection, that, uh, that we can have eternal life by trusting and believing in that, in that and, and, and receiving Christ, calling out to his name, receiving him as our Lord and Savior. I pray that, Lord, if there's anyone here that has not done that, that they would do that today. And also for those of us who have, Lord, that we would be willing to take that step to share our testimony. Maybe that is all that is needed to turn this world around. And uh, is it that simple, Lord? Father, help us to be faithful, to do that thing that you've called us to do, to make disciples, to share Christ. And in doing so, uh, Lord, that you're honored and you're glorified. We'll leave the results to you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.